All right. Well, hey, good morning, St. Mark. Great to see all of you this bright, sunshiny Sunday. Uh, it's nice that it's getting a little cooler in the evenings. You can finally open up those windows and get a little reprieve. Uh, but that's also a sign that fall is upon us. And as fall comes, the church year comes to a close. So a lot of our readings are going to be focused on those end times, those last days, and uh, Jesus making his way to Jerusalem. We're going to spend some time today in Luke chapter 14, uh, spending our time in the Gospel of Luke. Please join in singing our opening hymn, Lord Jesus Christ, Be Present Now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended thee and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray thee of thy boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, 
I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. We give thanks to you, O God, we give thanks, for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. At the set time that I appoint, I will judge with equity, for not from the east or from the west, and not from the wilderness comes lifting up, but I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. It is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. 
O Lord of grace and mercy, teach us by your Holy Spirit to follow the example of your Son in true humility, that we may withstand the temptations of the devil and with pure hearts and minds avoid ungodly pride. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading comes from the book of Proverbs, the 25th chapter, and it starts at the second verse. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. Take away the dross from silver, and it will go to the silversmith for jewelry. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. Do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king, and do not stand in the place of the great. For it is better that he say to you, come up here, than that you should be put lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. Do not go hastily to court, for what will you do in the end when your neighbor has put you to shame? Debate your case with your neighbor, and do not disclose the secret to another, lest he who hears it expose your shame and your reputation be ruined. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. The epistle reading comes from the book of Hebrews, the 13th chapter, and it starts at the first verse. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have, For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember, those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar for which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. For they watch out for your souls as those who must go and give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 14th chapter. Now it happened, as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. 
And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus, answering, spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent. And he took him and healed him and let him go. Then he answered them, saying, Which of you, having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? They could not answer him regarding these things. So he told a parable to those who were invited, when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him, and he who invited you and him come and say to you, Give place to this man, and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he also said to him who had invited him, When you give a dinner or supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess the Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day.
grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we continue in the Gospel of St. Luke, part of the narrative of Jesus heading toward Jerusalem. For what purpose? To die, to be lifted up, to show himself as the sacrifice acceptable unto the Father for the sins of all mankind, that we might have life and salvation through his blood. As he travels that way, we remember last week that there was a narrow way strive to enter through the narrow gate. The concluding part of that, not read, was Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often I wanted to gather your children as a hen gathers her brood, but you were not willing. You would not. Here Jesus lays forth the real problem with humanity. It's not that God hasn't done His part, but it's that human beings want to approach God on their own terms. Now it happened, verse 1 of chapter 14, as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath that they watched him closely. Luke, in this narrative, is letting us understand once again that it seems to be the habit of the Pharisees to invite Jesus. Last week I mentioned Simon the Pharisee from earlier in Luke, where a woman washed his feet with her tears and fragrant oil. Jesus was often invited. Sadly, he wasn't invited so that the giver of the feast, the invitor, would learn from Jesus. But often, as Luke points out here, they watched him closely. Interestingly enough, I believe there are seven times before this that Jesus had already violated the Sabbath rules. Isn't that the way mankind is? We set up rules that we can follow that others can't so that when they break them, we look good and they don't. That's what the Pharisees loved to do. They had their rules. They followed them all. Jesus makes comment about the tithing of mint. Imagine being so religious and worried about what God would think of you that you wake up in the morning and you look at that clover or you look at that, that, that mint in your garden and you go, wow, there are ten new leaves this morning. I must grab one little leaf and offer it unto God for his blessing, a tenth of my mint. Yes, indeed, legalism runs deep in the hearts of mankind. They watched him closely so that they might trip him up. They tried with money. They tried with healings on the Sabbath. He had already done many things to aggravate the Pharisees. How dare the disciples of Jesus eat without washed hands? Don't they know the tradition of the elders? My goodness, what will happen if we let this go? The world will go to hell in a handbasket, as it were. We can't have that. But yet, the disciples would pluck heads of grain walking through the field, and they would watch Jesus and his disciples, and they would find fault in everything they did. And Jesus would simply say, Have you not heard what David did with the showbread? Instantly, their mouths were silenced. We all honor and love King David, but even he broke the rules in order to feed his men as he was on the run. The priest gave him the showbread, which was only lawful for the priest to eat. But King David and his men ate of it. Jesus is laying down a principle, and behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. Now, dropsy, they believe, was the swelling of the limbs, fluid buildup, such that it was uncurable, often seen as a curse, really any sickness in in the Old Testament was seen as a curse. God's favor was obviously not on him. Much like the man who was born blind, they said, Lord, who sinned, his parents or him, that he was born blind? The equation in the mind of mankind is to look at the externals rather than looking at the way God looks at things. God took care of this when he sent Samuel to anoint King David. Many of us remember way back in 1 Samuel chapter 16 how the prophet had gone to Jesse and said, show me your sons, and he ran through the sons, the oldest, of course, the strongest and the best, and worked his way down, and all of the sons 
Surely this was the one. Surely this was the one. They got to the end. The Lord said unto Samuel, You judge by appearance. That's how man judges. But I see into the heart. And we know that King David was a man after God's own heart. Sinner as he was, he was a good king for Israel. So, we're not certain if this was a setup, but either way, the Pharisees who had invited him and, and the people who invited him and were watching him closely were just waiting to see whether or not he would once again violate the Sabbath law by healing on the Sabbath. We all know the rule, right? Six days you shall work, and on the Sabbath day it is sacred unto the Lord. Keep it holy. Don't work. Still to this day, there is no cooking. There's no turning on of lights. There's all kinds of rules for those who attempt to follow the Sabbath according to modern-day Jewish regulations. Jesus asked the lawyers and the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? How might they answer that question? Well, they were really stuck in a conundrum as they were trying to trap Jesus. Jesus was busy exposing their faulty thinking. Often in life, we have to find a balance. I'm not saying commit sins. That's not what I'm teaching. But often you can find that there is a, a juxtaposition of what the law says on the surface and what must be done. Yes, the law says don't work. The example that Jesus gave is, which one of you having a donkey or an ox, some manuscripts read a son, that falls into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day. See, the juxtaposition is that it is work that shall not be done on the Sabbath day. Clearly, going out into the field, finding your animal in a pit, and working hard and diligently to get the animal out of the pit would qualify as work. But is that not the loving thing to do for your animal? Who could leave an animal in a pit, watch it struggle and die? We've probably all seen those YouTube videos where they go out and they rescue baby seals and turtles and all kinds of things, and our hearts get all kind of warm and fuzzy. I know mine does. I love to see animals rescued and animals helped. Deer get caught in fences and hunters go out and they get them out of the, 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 the fence and let them run free, and everyone's heart rejoices. Yeah, but it's the Sabbath day. Let it die. Of course not. Do you see the juxtaposition? Do you violate the law of God in order to do good? Well, the obvious answer is absolutely. The law of God was not designed to put limits on love. The law of God was not designed to put limits on helpfulness. The law of God was designed for our benefit, not our curse. Now, when we break the law, we are under its curse because the law does make demands that it must be followed. But the Pharisees had it wrong. They kept silent. He took the man and he healed him and said, go. After he brings up the example of having an animal or a son or a donkey fall into the pit, they couldn't answer him regarding these things. See, they knew they were trapped. If they were to say, well, you leave the animal there and satisfy their, their legalistic ways, everyone at the table would say that's absolutely absurd. For who of us can look upon suffering and not help? If they were to answer the other way, well, of course, Jesus, you help your son, you help your animals, you do good on the Sabbath day. All of the other Pharisees would point their fingers and go, see, not as righteous as we are following the law. So they said nothing. Much like when Jesus would ask them about the baptism of John, was it from heaven or from man? There were given a little insight into their thinking. They had a little conclave and they said, oh no, what do we answer this Jesus? If we say, well, it's, it's from God, he's going to say, then why didn't we believe the prophet? If we say it's from men, the whole world knows that John is a prophet of God, and the people will be angry with us. So they say unto Jesus, well, we don't know. 
And see, that's the cop-out of the world. It makes no decisions, and we see that a lot today. Well, it could be this, it could be that. Jesus might be God, but then again, maybe some of the religions of the world might be okay too. I, I'm not going to make a decision. It's not for me to judge. We see this in our college classrooms. No one can make a judgment on anything, and the whole world falls apart rather than giving right answer. So he told a parable to those who were invited. He noted how they chose the best places, and he said to them, when you're invited to a wedding feast, don't sit down at the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited. And the one who invited you come and say, give place to this man, and with shame you take the lowest place. Jesus was calling out their hypocrisy and their false religiosity concerning the man with dropsy. Of course, it's good to help a child of Abraham on the Sabbath day. And now concerning what they thought of themselves, he brings up this issue. You might have recognized it from Proverbs 25. There the example was don't sit in the highest place before a king. Here, it's at a wedding feast, and we still have this today, right? Usually when you go to a wedding and you get the invite, most of the time the bride and the groom do a good job of, of organizing the tables so you know that you're at table 8 and you're at table 15 and you can not be embarrassed because you sit where they kind of told you to sit. But imagine an open seating plan, and there at the head table, they usually put the bride, the groom, the bridesmaids and the groomsmen, they seat them all at the table. They usually get served first, and they're at that table with the centerpieces and all the goodies. Imagine there was no seating chart, and you just sat yourself up at that head table. Well, clearly the bride and groom like me. They sent me an invitation. Here I am, and you take a seat. You very well may not be given the place of honor, and then the master of ceremonies, the MC, or even the bride and groom themselves would say, um, that would, that, that's reserved for my mom and dad. Why don't you take a hike? Of course, you would be embarrassed. Instead, Jesus says, sit down in the lowest place so that when the person who invited you sees you in the, in the back over by the, by the dishwashers with the clanging and the the waiters and waitresses coming by and possibly hitting you in the head with the tray and not, not the best place in the house, they will say, friend, go up higher, and then in front of everyone else, you'll receive glory. Now, a word of caution here, because we've probably all met people like this in our lives. They're so self-deprecating, you can see right through it, and you realize that they're actually not being humble at all. They're actually living with false humility. You've probably met them, right? Oh, I'm not good at anything. What do you mean you're not good at anything? You, you just won Wimbledon. I know, but I'm a terrible, terrible tennis player. Really? You just kind of won the gold medal at the Olympics. Yeah, but I'm not a great swimmer. My name is Michael Phelps. I'm, I'm terrible at swimming. Really, dude? We've met people with false humility. That's certainly a caution that we don't want to do here. But we do want to, as the Scriptures say in other places, not think more highly of ourselves than we ought. We ought to be able to recognize our position in this world for what it is. I often mention this in Bible studies. We've all been taught the name Alexander the Great. Changed the world. Ran everything for a while. Now, I'm sure somewhere along the way he had children and grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren and even great-great-greats. I'm not sure how many I would need to fill in. But today, somewhere in the world is, an, is a blood relative of Alexander the Great. Are they still in charge? Yeah, no. See, the world quickly fades. The children of Abraham Lincoln, it quickly fades. So we ought to understand the principle that Jesus here is laying down is that we should not exalt ourselves, but rather allow God to exalt us. Jesus said it this way in the Gospel of John. If I glorify myself, that is of nothing, but it is the Father who glorifies me. And His Word means everything. Jesus taught that we should do our deeds in secret, 
Not that we shouldn't do our good works and let others glorify God through the work of the church and through our own personal lives. We can be salt and light. But in the example that Jesus was teaching in Matthew chapter 6 and in other places, he was trying to explain that there are lots of people who will do things for the glory of men. They will go out of their way to let everyone know how good they are so that they can receive their glory. When everyone's clapping, when everyone's giving you the awards banquets, when everyone is running around speaking how great your name is, you've received your reward, Jesus teaches. But rather, we ought to do our deeds not looking for the accolades and praise of men, but rather looking for the praise of God. This can even happen in the church, and I realize this is somewhat of a sensitive subject, but I've heard it said, well, I did all of this volunteering and nobody said thank you. Fair enough. I always try to say thank you, and I try to encourage appreciation, good and right appreciation. But if I flip that just a little bit for a moment and put on the not-so-happy, not so uh, not so comforting pastor hat for just a moment, I might rightly ask the very same question that Jesus asks. Well, is the only reason you volunteered at the church to receive accolades? Is the only reason you volunteered is so that someone would say thank you? I'm not saying to be unappreciative or not recognize each other's good deeds. No, not at all. But what does that say about your heart if the only reason you were volunteering was to get the praise of men? See, that's one of those ouch moments. That's, we're coming up on confirmation so the children take sermon reports. That's, that's a law moment because the reality is I get very offended when people don't appreciate me. Put your hand up if you're just like me. Do you get frustrated when people don't appreciate you? You make a meal for the children and they never say thank you. And then they leave their dishes on the counter. It's frustrating when you do good things for your spouse. How many times do, do we harbor resentments in our relationship with our spouse because we did something nice and they just completely ignored the fact that we went out of our way to do something nice for our spouse? Put your hand up if you're in that boat. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Well, maybe don't put your hand up, otherwise your spouse will be mad at you. But we understand that there is within our nature the opposite nature of God. And by that, I mean Jesus was quite clear when he said that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to be a servant and to give his life as a ransom. And he willingly laid down his life. And that closes this final principle here. When you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Why? Because then you will be like our Father in heaven. When we give to God, and we're just about to sing that hymn, we give thee but thine own. The air that I breathe is his. The, the house that I have, I didn't make the trees grow that did it. So there's always that balance. Jesus never says, don't invite your friends. Of course, having friends is good. Jesus even calls us friends. He chose the 12. Friends are great. Invite them over. Have a barbecue. Celebrate what God has given you. That's also in Ecclesiastes. This is good for a man to eat and drink and to celebrate the works of his labor, giving thanks unto God. But by the same token, if your heart is such that you give an invite and don't get invited back and you find yourself cross and saying to yourself, well, I'm not inviting Jim Bob. I'm not inviting Sally. I'm not going to invite them. We threw a party and they showed up and they never invited me to their party. That reveals a whole lot more about you than it does about Jim Bob or Sally. Because it reveals that you are looking for your praise here on earth when Jesus said, store up your treasures in heaven. You'll be blessed because they can't repay you. Just as God is blessed, just as God is honored, just as God is glorified because we can never repay Him for His kindness unto us, so too we ought to be like God, giving, loving, 
charitable and gracious, even to the least of these. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise and join in singing with me the offertory. Please rise as we continue with the prayer of the church. O Heavenly Father, through the humbling of your Son, you have called us to a place at your heavenly table. Teach us to treasure this place of honor, and so to spurn the foolish honors of this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, our shepherd, Sustain the pastors of your church in their sacred charge. Establish them in your stead. Make their life of faith worthy of all honor and imitation. And inspire their hearers to honor you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, our God at creation, you instituted and blessed marriage as the lifelong union of a man and woman. And you commanded it to be held in honor by all as a sacred sign of Christ and his bride, the church. Grant your blessing, therefore, to all husbands and wives and to all who have pledged themselves to be united in holy matrimony according to your word, that their lives together in your name may be sanctified by your Holy Spirit in all wisdom, purity, self-sacrifice, and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God of justice, you exalt the humble, and humble the proud in your own appointed time. We commend to you the elected officials of our land. Grant them the desire to govern as though serving, and give to them wisdom and courage to know what is good and right in your sight, and to follow it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, grant peace, healing, and comfort 
to all who are sick, the suffering, those troubled in mind, those suffering from depression, those with chronic illnesses or pain, and those mourning the loss of loved ones, especially for Michelle and the family of Bill Peterson, for Ray, Dan, Sarah, Jim, Sharice, Lake, Herman, Therese, Jim, Bernie, Nancy, Kevin, Dawn, Alexander, the Wagner families, and those that we lift in our hearts before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant your Holy Spirit, O Lord, to those who share in the wedding feast of your Son as they receive his body and blood from your altar this day. Help them to eat and drink in true repentance and a firm faith and to their blessing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he's freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and dark angels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying... Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also, when they had supped, he took the cup. Again he had given thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to thee, almighty God, that thou hast refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we beseech thee that of thy mercy thou would strengthen us through the same in faith toward thee and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee, and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee, be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. seated for just a couple of quick announcements. The first, of course, is our Oktoberfest celebration coming up quickly, September 24th. There are sign-ups for volunteers. I believe most of the spots have been filled, uh, but please also RSVP so we know how much food uh, to get for you, your family, and even guests if you would like to invite them. Uh, they are welcome to come and celebrate. Next. Confirmation is going to be starting before we know it. Uh, next week, I would like to meet with the parents after the 11 a.m. service uh, for dissemination of materials and information, uh, and we will begin confirmation on September 11. Next, because the fall has come, handbell, choirs starting up again. Uh, Jim Vrabel should be joining us again shortly. Uh, for all of those things. Please consider signing up, being a part of that ministry and that team. Uh, it is, believe it or not, a lot of fun with some wonderful folks who add a wonderful dimension to our worship services. So if you can join, that would be great. And last is an announcement from the St. Mark Shining Lights. I'd like to invite Mr. Frank Anderson to come up and just say a few words about what's going on in Shining Lights world. All right, I am so thrilled to have an opportunity this morning to give us a new opportunity to shine our light. So the St. Mark Shining Light Committee, we've been working with the Youth for Christ. I just want to share with you who the Youth for Christ is. Uh, I have their mission statement here. It's to connect young people to Christ and get them plugged into local churches where they can grow into lifelong followers of Christ. So we got a really cool opportunity right here in the community. They have um, this ministry uh, called it's an after-school meal ministry and it's done right here at that place for teens which is on Pearl Road right here in Brunswick and believe it or not right here in our own community there are teens that don't have a meal after after school they don't have a place to go home to you know parents are working and this place gives them an opportunity to go to where they can um, engage in a lot of different programs they um, they do things like recreate recreational activities with these teens they get the teens to have some fun together, and they also serve them meals. So that's where we can come in and help. So basically what we've committed to is the first Thursday of every month, beginning in September through December, we're going to go there and provide a meal. So our objective is to go there with the meal. We're also going to serve it, right, so we can engage with these teens. So we have an opportunity to just, uh, you know, share Christ's love and just engage with them, and that's where it all starts. So we have a sign-up sheet in the back in the narthex. Again, right now our commitment is the first Thursday of every month, except for September. Actually, that one's kind of uh, kind of got changed up a little bit. We're doing it on a Tuesday, but we have Rick and Kathy Curry who are going to volunteer for that one. So one thing I want to mention, you can serve in many ways. You can either just donate money, you can purchase the meal, you can purchase the meal or make the meal and then serve the meal. So there's a lot of different opportunities. And if for some reason like you don't have the funds or the time to prepare a meal, we can do that for you, and if you just want to serve, you can go over there and just serve the meal. 
All the details, including the dates and the times, are in the back. And you can also find more information in the September uh, church bulletin. Thank I'm oh, sorry. Uh, ch church newsletter. Thank you, Carmen. Anything else I missed? All right. Thank you. Blessings on your Sunday. Thank you very much, Frank. Appreciate that and all the work of the Shining Lights. As always, go in peace. Continue serving the Lord as I know you do. I love you, St. Mark. We'll see you soon.